You know, I was thinking we could sort of use discrete scaling symmetry for the soccer game. So I think if I think about the FIFA rules that I looked up, it's something like 100 meters here, something like 64 meters here. But, you know, I also figured we're not going to have 22 players. So I was hoping, you know, maybe we could get a 7 to 7 or something. So. What that would mean is we would take our field and maybe if we want to keep the same sort of square footage, then maybe what we do is we multiply everything by 7 over 11, which wow, would be this. Oh. Yeah, but here comes the problem, right? If we have 5 and we divide by 2, yeah. we have 2 and a half. And this illustrates the discrete scaling symmetry because if we have two and a half, that's not allowed unless we play two against three. Anyways, so I, I would argue, right, what we have to do is we have to apply some sort of discrete scaling symmetry and hopefully that's one aspect that I'm going to come to today. So maybe we need to do something like 2 over 11 or so, which would be allowed scaling. But, you know, I still argue we can't really split a person in two. So not every number is allowed. Anyways, so this does sort of provide a somewhat smooth transition to my talk. So somewhat smooth. Um, I'm going to start off by um, telling you a little bit about what is unitarity, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. And I think this is also a great opportunity to really thank the KITP for having us here, um, having the program Living Near Unitarity here, where we really have um, AMO physicists, as was mentioned. We have nuclear physicists, and we also had high energy physicists come together and talk about things that uh, unite us. And, you know, you might notice if you're talking about AMO in the low energy regime, and then we're talking about high energy physics, you know, depending on which examples you're using, what you really see is you see something like, you know, more than 15 orders of magnitude in energy between these sort of areas. And so clearly it's not that energy scale that brings us together here, but it's something a little bit different. And hopefully I get to that sort of in the second part of my talk. So let's start off with uh, living near unitarity. So I think I can remove this nice illustration here. So if we are thinking about unitarity, um, the first thing that I imagine that comes to mind when people hear this word is especially those um, from the gravitational field um, sort of area. You know, in quantum mechanics, we have unitary time evolution. And I imagine that this is sort of something that everybody still remembers from undergraduate quantum mechanics. And indeed, that's a good starting point for thinking about unitarity. So we have unitarity in quantum mechanics. Um, we have a time evolution operator that's unitary. What does this mean? Essentially, sort of in plain language, we can translate this as, you know, if you have some sort of quantum state, you know, it evolves with time. And, you know, you can't lose anything, you can't gain anything. So if you count up where your probability is at the end, you always end up with uh, a probability of one. And this also sort of leads us a little bit closer to our program here. We can think about the S matrix, which brings us from some initial state to some final state. And 
what we can do is we can write this in terms of the unitarity operators by taking two limits. The first limit is, let's say, my time t1 goes to minus infinity. My time t2 goes to infinity. And then what I can do is I can take my initial state. I have my time evolution operator here. And I have my final state here. Right? So what I want to think about is some sort of reaction. Say I have an incoming state. I'm going to start far away from my target here. I have a final state. To do that, I have to go to infinity. OK, you can believe that's described by our uh, time evolution operator, which we know is unitary. So we're going to have an S matrix here, which is also unitary. And because this S matrix is unitary, it means that we do have what is called unitary bounds, or unitarity bounds. And essentially, what this means is, if you go through the math, that um, if we have this S matrix here, because it is unitary, there's some constraints on scattering observables. And uh, just to make this maybe a little bit more concrete, what this means is, if I look at the cross section, there's a limit, so I'm just going to write it very pictorially right now. So I should probably put a length squared here to at least get the units right. So we're going to have a cross section that is unitarily limited, which simply means that because we can't create, we can't lose anything, um, that cross section has to be smaller than or equal to some number times L squared. And this living near unitarity, and if I, I'm told I should do this at the middle here, not on the edges. So if we are thinking about living near unitarity, the first thing we have to think about, what does it mean to live at unitarity? And that's what I was just trying to describe. If we actually saturate this unitary bound, then we are living at unitarity. So this is sort of um, what we're interested in and what is sort of one of the common starting points in this program. So let me maybe make this just a little bit more explicit. Because what I want to do is I want to give you a feeling for sort of a quantity that we're going to be using quite a bit, which is the S-wave scattering lengths. But I'm going to call this A sub S. But I really don't want to have us go through the whole framework of scattering theory. I think you'll all appreciate if I don't do this. So I'm going to say, yeah, OK, good. At least we're on the same page on, on something. So I, but you know, I don't have to do this to sort of um, introduce what I want to do. So let me say I'm going to look at my um, you know, so a simple situation. I have a plane wave coming in. Again, you know, you might recall all these things from your intro quantum course. I have a scattering center here, and then we're going to look at the outgoing wave. And of course, um, one of the things that we're interested in in this program is looking at sort of consequences on scattering observables, scattering physics near unitarity. And uh, at least from what I can tell, two-body collisions are probably the uh, common denominator between our program and the gravitational wave program. I tried to find a few more analogies. Maybe we have waves. That's another analogy. But I think beyond that, probably, well, 
I'm looking forward to learning at the barbecue what other commonalities we might have. But okay, so we have, um, say, this uh, plane wave coming in. So I'm going to describe this. There's not going to be many formulas, so I, I'm just going to start off with a couple, and hopefully um, it's going to reduce throughout the discussion. So I'm going to come in with a plane wave. So that's this part here. And now this is my scattering center here. So this is the outgoing wave. And so we need to describe our outgoing part here. So we have some prefactor, and then we have our spherically outgoing wave here. And uh, what I want to do is I want to write out my uh, scattering amplitude. And of course, I'm making a lot of simplifications here. I'm assuming that we have a um, central potential. So actually, I'm not even going to use this here. But I'm going to put some k value here because we have an incoming energy. Um, I'm also going to assume, because our interaction potential is spherically symmetric, that we don't have multiple channels. So we can look at each partial wave separately. And so this leads us to a sum over the different orbital angular momenta. So if I write this out here, and again, there's not going to be too many equations, just a few. my polynomial here. So again, the details are not too important. There's one thing that I want you to sort of notice here. This is my uh, else partial wave component of that scattering matrix and I was writing earlier. So again, that's unitary. And so the first thing that you notice, um, it's not hard to see, if the SL of K is equal to 1, great, then all of this vanishes here. So this is great. I said that's a scattering matrix. So if all of this disappears here, we're not going to have um, a scattered wave. So this all makes sense. Um, and also, it's easy to see that if we have this, we have unitarity. Uh, sorry, we, we, we have the unitary um, operator. OK, so this is great. Um, the other thing is that um, if we go through scattering theory and we write down the um, S of the L of K, we can write this as 1 plus 2i K F sub L of K. But this is the partial wave component of our scattering amplitude. and um, Sort of um, the reason I want to write it this way is because we just discussed if we have one here, we don't have scattering. So that means I can cover this up and we don't have scattering. So this is sort of nice. And what I want to do now is I want to think about how I can actually sort of saturate this bound here. And I want to hand-wavingly argue that um, for that to happen, what we need or what, what we uh, want to aim for is we want this to be minus 2. So we, we need um, unitary operator. And so if we say this is bounded in some way, if I, we make this equal to minus 2, then we sort of have the largest deviation from 1. So I'm, I'm, you know, it's a little bit hand-waving my argument here. Uh, we can make this um, more rigorous. But what follows from this, and this is um, an important aspect, if I now go to the LS0 channel, and say, you know, this is what I want. And we now write down what the um, partial wave component, um, the LS0 partial wave component of the scattering amplitude is. Then we see that this has to be equal to 
I over k for this to be equal to minus 2. OK, so this is going to be in quotation marks sort of maximal scattering. Now, of course, I can do a slightly uh, more detailed calculation. And again, I don't, I'm going to be done with equations very soon. Um, so if we work out the full expression, we can write this as minus ik plus k cotangent delta naught of k. So this is just our L is 0 phase shift. And then this part we can write down in the low energy expansion. So k cotangent delta naught of k is equal to minus 1 over as plus 1 half our effective k squared plus a bunch of other terms. So the point that I want to make here is that hopefully you can see, right, this is sort of what I argued we want to have. Now we can look at this expression here where I've written it down sort of in its full glory. So it means that this part here has to vanish. And then we can look at this expression here. And what we see is, let, let's for now assume that we can sort of look at an ideal case and say our effective range is small. Actually, I'm going to set it to zero, so we, we don't have any effective range corrections here. Then you see that 1 over AS has to go to zero, and this in, terms me, in, in turn means that our S-wave scattering lengths should be infinitely large for us to have maximal scattering and to be sitting at unitarity. So this is our point that we want to live next to. So we want that S-wave scattering length to be infinitely large. And we want the effective range, the shape parameter, whatever else comes here in that expansion to be equal to zero. And then when we live near unitarity, well, we got a bunch of options. We can make this a little bit less than infinity. And we can also turn on the other parameters in our theory. And so that's sort of where we are living or how we are living um, near unitarity. So if I now go back to, I remember. If I now go back to the cross section and I write that down for the case where we are in the lowest partial wave channel, then what we see is that when we are at unitarity, this is 4 pi over k squared. So this is when we are sort of saturating the unitarity bound. So there are really two things that I want to uh, point out here that are absolutely critical. And I think that are really, really key take-home messages. One is, if our S-wave scattering length is large, this means we really have a large parameter in our theory. And this means that if we are at unitarity or eventually we're going to live near unitarity, this means that we do have a large length scale in our problem, and that really suggests immediately that we are not perturbative. So it's a strongly correlated system. Let, let me say it's a strongly correlated system, because that's a better description than non-perturbative. And the other point that I want to make here is um, the following. We started off with some sort of potential here. 
And, you know, I didn't specify that potential. I should have mentioned that I am assuming that it's a short-range potential. But other than that, I didn't really assume anything. And it's, it's a truly amazing aspect of sort of what we're doing in the program that if you now look at this cross-section at unitarity, there's nothing left that would tell us what that interaction potential is. So the only quantity here that's showing up is the wave number, and that's characterizing our incoming plane wave here. So we are completely independent of the microscopic details. And you can already see this by this sort of simple scattering framework. And this also suggests that because we are independent of the microscopic details, this really gives us an avenue to say, hey, right, if we're in the low energy regime, we have, say, two atoms colliding. But if we are looking at nuclear physics, OK, I should give these names. Because if I draw my nuclei and they're colliding, they also just look like blobs. So right, whether we have, um, say, nuclei colliding, or whether we have atoms, say, colliding, at least when we are directly at unitarity, um, the microscopic details of that interaction here are completely disappearing from the uh, framework. And this also means that we have a way to connect physics that is occurring on very different energy scales and very different um, length scales. So those are sort of the two points I want to make here. This goes away and uh, well, goes away in the sense it's infinitely large, doesn't set a scale. And uh, so we don't have any microscopic details left in our theory. So the next thing I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about right, we're looking at uh, few body universe, universality near unitarity. So what do we mean by this? Before I go into details, I do want to give you one example just to, you know, it seems like looking at Everything that I wrote down here, you know, it seems a bit academic in that I'm enforcing a bunch of things and sending things to infinity, sending things to zero. Is this really something we can do? Um, do we find this in nature somewhere? So let me just give you one example. Um, so let's say I have what we call a two-component Fermi gas. This is actually a very nice ideal realization of the system. In this case, for now, let me assume that these are atoms here. And these uh, pseudo spins up and down, they're realized by having different hyperfine states. So I have an atom in one hyperfine state, an atom in another hyperfine state. The other hyperfine states don't matter, so effectively I just have spin up, spin down. So these are pseudo spins. And it turns out that in ultra cold atom systems, they're Feshbach resonances. And that means that essentially we can send this S wave scattering length to infinity. Of course, the effective range is not exactly zero, but it's to a very good approximation zero. And so if you look at the system and you sort of ask yourself now, what are the parameters in our theory? Well, we have an infinite scattering length. That's gone. It doesn't set anything. We have assumed that the effective range is zero, so that doesn't set a length scale. So what do we have left? We have left a density, or if you prefer, an average particle spacing, and if we assume that we have temperature in our system, we also have the de Broglie wavelengths. So based on what I told you, those are the length scales 
uh, density sets our average interparticle spacing. So these are the length scales that uh, we can identify. And indeed, if we now look at N de Broglie uh, wavelengths cubed, then this is our uh, dimensionless Parameter, and what you can do now is you can actually look at this in the limit where this is fairly small. So that means that we are above the transition temperature of our two component Fermi gas. So we have a relatively high temperature, but not so high that we have to worry about other partial wave channels. So we want to stay in the S wave channel. And so in this case, what you can do is you can actually work out the equation of state of this system in terms of solving the one-body problem, the two-body problem, the three-body problem, the four-body problem. And so my, for consistency, I should really use, sorry about that, I should use the same. So these are my atoms in different hyperfine states. So these are the different portions that I have. When I look at the four-body problem, I should look at three up, one down, and two up, two down. And so, of course, single particle we know how to do. We do know how to solve the two-body problem. Right? So you can sort of see I'm moving toward few-body physics and giving you an example here where I'm using few-body physics to describe my many-body system. And I'm arguing that what we can do, this is essentially just the standard virial expansion or virial, virial equation of state that you might remember from uh, statmec and thermodynamics that you can solve the one body, the two body, the three body, the four body problem, and that way you can build up the equation of state of the many body system. And this also tells you, you know, why am I interested in few body systems? Well, these problems on their own are actually very interesting. My group worked on calculating the four body or force order virial coefficient in the zero range limit um, quite a bit. So what we did is we developed a, a pass integral Monte Carlo formalism that can actually account for zero range interactions at unitarity um, accurately. But then, you know, putting this together, using few body physics, we can describe many body systems. And that is one of the interests that we have in this program, namely to connect the few body and the many body worlds. This system has been realized experimentally. Um, and, you know, this is not just sort of academics, the virial equation of state is actually used in the experiment to um, extract the temperature of the system. So they do have a density profile in the wings of the densities of the profile. The density is very low. And that means they are actually in the regime above the transition temperature. And they use the virial equation of state, the virial coefficients, to actually, uh, from experimental data, uh, help calibrate the temperature. So it's also of practical interest. Now, I haven't sort of told you about universality in detail and then deviations from universality, but this is one example where you can see sort of looking at these systems that live at unitarity is quite interesting. The other thing that I want to mention already, sort of looking ahead a little bit, is that um, a somewhat more complicated virial equation of state has then has also been used to describe neutron matter. So there, this assumption is not so justified anymore. So we have to look at effective range corrections. 
And also, you do have to look at other higher partial wave components. So there's a bit more going on there. There are more scales coming in. But the idea is really the same. And so this illustrates, again, that there are really nice connections between atomic physics and uh, nuclear physics, both at the few and the many-body um, level. So again, this was sort of looking ahead a little bit. Thought it would be good for you to have at least one example in your head what we're dealing with, not just numbers are big and other numbers are small or other parameters. So let me try to discuss universality a little bit. Um, and the first thing I think that I should do is I should change the title of my talk. And I really should change this to what do I mean by it and why do I care? We've had a lot of discussions within the program and within the conference. And um, everybody comes at it from a slightly different angle. Um, but this said, hopefully there are some commonalities that, that folks here agree with. If not, you'll meet them at the barbecue and you can uh, discuss different viewpoints on what universality um, is. So um, let's discuss that a little bit. Last week, we had a very nice conference. I guess I should say that I organized it, but it was a very nice conference. I co-organized it, so many thanks to Chris, Alejandro, and uh, Olivier as well. We had a very nice uh, conference, and one of the speakers was uh, Nobel laureate Eric Connell. And he started his talk off by saying, OK, few body universality, what is it? Well, I know it when I see it. OK, I, I could adopt that viewpoint, but maybe then the talk would be over. So may, maybe I don't quite do that. So I try to fill this in with a little bit um, of the meaning. And to do this, um, I could start off by saying, OK, maybe there are a lot of discussions on what is universality sort of this within the group of experts. I do think we um, agree what universality is not, is not, at least to some degree. So it's not something distinct or exclusive, particular individual. It, it's the opposite of that. But what, what exactly is it? And to sort of um, introduce a couple of ideas, maybe what I can do, or what we can do, is we can look a little bit at sort of some lessons or, or some background, again, from statistical mechanics. And I should emphasize um, a lot of this uh, view can also be found in the uh, review article from uh, Hammer and Brighton. Really, really uh, nice work. And so basically, if you look at statistical mechanics, you know, what it says there is that we have a number of properties that are independent of the dynamical details of the system. So we want something that's independent of details. That's um, something I already sort of highlighted. And then to sort of look at statistical mechanics um, ideas, What's frequently used is sort of renormalization group. And again, I think there's something that uh, can be applied quite nicely um, for our case. Namely, there you have relevant and irrelevant operators. And the relevant operators describe physics at uh, large length scales, and the irrelevant operators describe physics at short length scales. And so the idea is that, yes, you know, large length scales we should describe 
everything that's sort of detailed and at the microscopic level we sort of want to get rid of. And, and so in some sense that's the same in our case. Um, if we are looking at universal features for the most part, what we are hoping to do is we are hoping to describe the large length scales, low energy properties of the particular system but not so much the high energy or short distance properties um, of the system. It's not quite true, and this is where some discussion comes in, for example. There are also universal features in the high energy limit um, of a problem, but it's not something that I sort of want to get into um, in this, this um, talk. So in statistical mechanics, what you would have is if you want to push this analogy a little bit further, we have a critical point. Say that's the critical point, and then we have deviations from the critical point. So at this point, we have a um, correlation length that's diverging. So this would be our point where the inverse scattering length is uh, zero, so we have an infinitely large scattering length. And then um, away from this, we have sort of, let's say, I make one over AS here. Away from this, we have some sort of regime where maybe um, we are universal. So in this sense, we do have some similarity with how um, universality works in statistical mechanics. So what I want to do a little bit is I want to discuss this regime a little bit more, sort of discuss it in terms of um, symmetries. Again, that is something that, that um, has analogies, of course, in statistical mechanics, and it is something that we discussed in the program. And then um, eventually we will have, well, if we have symmetry, we also will have symmetry breaking. And um, right, the idea is, well, maybe we can still sort of uh, work in around the universal regime and get something in the vicinity. So this is sort of where I'm headed with this. Actually. So the first thing that I want to do is I just want to um, work very simply in this regime where S before I'm going to say the effective range and all other parameters are still zero. But what I am going to allow for is that the S wave scattering length is finite now. So we are living near um, the unitary point now. And so if we ask, you know, what is the symmetry that we now have, we can look at, so again, I, I'm going to use a very simple example. I'm going to say, let's look at the similar scattering process as before. I'm going to use my relative um, coordinate now, have the reduced mass, so we have kinetic energy, everything is non-relativistic, simple Schrodinger quantum mechanics. Let me just say we put our scattering lengths into the theory, so we have, uh, for simplicity, say a delta function interaction and say this is the Schrodinger equation that we want to look at. Time independent, very simple. Alternatively, of course, I could write this down as the time dependent part. And then I should, of course, also put 
this in here. So let me remove this. Okay, so just again, simple two-body problem. S-wave scattering lengths is, is the, the only um, scale here. And you know what we want is we want to sort of think about what, what is the symmetry that we have in our problem. And this is a very simple symmetry, right? If we send AS to lambda AS, we send R to lambda R, and we send T to lambda squared times R. You can plug this in, keeping in mind that my right, delta function has units of one over length to the three. You'll see immediately that this gives us the same equation. So what this means is that we have a continuous scaling symmetry here. And the idea is now, right, if we have a continuous scaling symmetry, this means it's universal. We can multiply things by any scale we want. So lambda is just some number here. So it's different from the example I gave at the beginning where I looked at the soccer field and I said we can only use discrete values here. It's any value that's allowed. And then um, this also explains how it can be that we can apply one and the same theory to say two atoms or two neutrons because we have the scaling parameter here that allows us to really make the system from go from small to big. And so we have the same theory that can describe things at, the sa uh, at different um, length scales. So of course, this is very simple. Right? It's take, take a balloon and you blow it up and you um, reduce its size, but it's still a balloon. It doesn't look any different. It, you know, we just, so, and, and this sort of treatment has been applied, something we discussed also um, during the program, has been applied to, say, looking at two atoms, say, two helium-4 atoms. But a similar framework also gives um, a reasonably good first-order description of, say, the deuteron So neutron proton scattering, for example. And again, I'm, I'm sort of um, not discussing a lot of details here. There are, of course, effective range corrections here. There are multiple channels. And the effective range corrections are exactly what's going to um, lead to a breaking of the scaling symmetry. And so one of the things that we might then be interested in, we might be interested in uh, universal corrections. Um, that is, we are interested in a theory that in a universal way, for example, includes the corrections by going order by order, say, in the effective range over the scattering things. So this would be you know, just a simple two-body example here where we can say we start off with a system that has a symmetry, means we only have this S-wave scattering length. Then we allow for symmetry breaking. And any questions? I'm not sure what you mean by symmetry. I mean, this scale of AS, unless AS is zero, So what I mean by that is if you actually, um, yeah, okay, so you, you see that if I do this, I get a lambda here. And because I have this here, it gives me a lambda to the minus three because we have. But that transformation relates two systems with different AS, different categories. No, no. So say if I have, um, if I, 
Well, OK, I think I see what you mean in terms of an absolute scale. So say I, I look at, um, you know, say this is my distance, and these are two, you know, it's the potential for two helium atoms. And so if I say, you know, my scattering lengths in some unit, some range that, you know, let me just set this, put the range of the potential, uh, use the minimum of the potential to set the scale here. This has a particular value. Or I can even say, right, the scattering lengths in absolute units is of the order of 180 um, A naught. And so if I go to the um, Deuteron, so it depends a bit on which channel you look at, but the scattering lengths there might be um, of the order of something like 17 Fermi. And so what I'm arguing, or what I, sort of the point that I was making is that and you have the scaling parameter. And all I'm saying is, right, if I have my balloon that's really small at the scale of a few Fermi, I can blow that up. It's still a balloon. It's still the same thing. And I'm describing something at much larger scale. So I'm not saying anything fancy here. No, I, I, I agree with you. But if I say, look at the wave function, and you know, I just plot my wave function in the zero range approximation, which would look like this, but we only have a scattering length. And now I want to apply this to, say, this is the atom atom one. So I apply this to nuclei, right? I can make it this small. So I'm not saying anything um, deep at this point. But I am saying there is a symmetry in the problem, and that this continues. Usually, there's, a, there's some current or charge that commutes to the Hamiltonian. I don't see that as AS is fixed. Or is what is the operator that commutes to the Hamiltonian? Well, I find that in AMO, you know, uh, AS is not fixed. Well, it's not fixed. AS is, is well, not fixed change, because. because And see, they tune it from 100 to 20,000. I'm going to say the symmetry is that scaling is important. The symmetry is some charge, some operator that commutes to the Hamiltonian. So, what is the operator here that commutes to the Hamiltonian? Yeah, we, we, we can go through it afterwards. Let me sort of, I mean, I think what, what um, there, there are two things sort of that I want to highlight here. One is that, um, right, because of this scaling property, this continuous scaling property, what I can do is I can connect systems at different length scales. So that's the first thing that. But then you're saying that if you go from one length scale, one problem to another problem, you have this operation of scaling. But that's not a symmetry of a particular setup, not a symmetry of a helium helium. Yeah, so let, let me sort of continue to see where we go with this, and then we can come back to this point. And then the other thing that I sort of want to highlight, and again, I mentioned this earlier, that is um, what Chris pointed out, that the S-wave scattering lengths can actually be tuned in atomic systems. So it's actually a very useful um, tool um, to map out what is happening as we move along this um, axis here, where we have the attractive or negative scattering lengths on this side and the positive scattering lengths on this side. So as we go from 
in the case of fermions from the BCS to the BEC um, crossover. So if we just have the scattering lengths, you know, as I mentioned, the problem is relatively simple, but there are a number of universal numbers that we can derive. So if I come back to the problem that I sketched earlier, where we have spin up and spin down particles, for example. If we do know the S wave scattering lengths, and we now want to calculate the dimer dimer scattering lengths, what one finds is that that is just 0.6 times the S wave scattering lengths. And so by dimer dimer scattering lengths, what I mean here is if we now look at a pair because we have an S-wave scattering length, say that's positive, we can have pairs form, and um, we have dimer-dimer scattering lengths here. So this is something that we would refer to as a universal number. Um, so there's no microscopic details coming in. The only ingredient that we need is this um, S-wave scattering lengths. So it gets a little bit more interesting if, as an example, we look at um, the case where we have two, uh, sorry, where we don't just have um, the safe spin-ups, where, where we don't just look in the two-body sector as I did with the uh, helium-helium example, but say we look at three identical bosons. So if you look in the three-body sector, um, this scaling, or this transformation, that I pointed out here still applies. So you can generalize, write this down for three particles. But what you also see and find is that you really need to um, introduce a, a new length scale. There are a number of different ways to see this, one of which is if you just use these delta function interactions that I did before, you actually see the collapse to the center. So three identical bosons would not actually be stable. There are also different ways of seeing it, which would be that if you now try to include effective range corrections, you would see that they're not just coming in sort of nicely in a way that we can treat them perturbatively, but they give rise to logarithmic corrections. And this means, if you go through it, that there's a discrete scaling symmetry. So I don't want to go through um, all the details, but sort of just uh, highlight a couple of um, interesting aspects. If we now have the S wave scattering lengths here, or one over the S wave scattering lengths. We would have a, a two body, if I plot the square root of the energy here, we would have a two body bound state here. And then due to um, this feature here, we have an infinite sequence of three body bound states which are also known, and I'm not drawing them to scale here by any means, um, but there's sort of the E3n, E3n plus 1, E3n plus 2, and so on. So there's an infinite tower of three-body states, um, and it turns out that but right, you don't have an arbitrary scaling factor anymore, but you have a discrete scaling factor, 
And that is where my example with the soccer field um, came in. So by discrete scaling factor, so I mean there's a factor that turns out to be about 22.7. We can calculate, this was already calculated by Efimov in 1971. And that parameter sort of tells us how far the energy levels here in this scale are separated. So if we have an energy level here, we also know there's going to be the same energy curve here and here and here. So we have discrete scaling as opposed to we can just take any number lambda and have continuous um, scaling here. Now let me just use the last two minutes the last two minutes to sort of comment on some of the things that um, are very ongoing right now that people in the program are looking at. Right? This is a starting point. There are many, many questions here. If we look at, say, again, the helium system, there are now experiments. So in helium, helium lives on this scale about here. It only has two of these three body bound states. So actually, let me redraw it. So it would be living at this at um, this scattering length here. So there's one ground state, there's an excited state. One of the things of the recent developments is that the quantum mechanical density of a three-body state can now be imaged experimentally. So that's really, really um, interesting, exciting. There have been time-dependent studies done on the helium dimer. So this is a regime where um, high-energy physics, high-intense lasers meet low-energy physics. Then there's a lot of questions about what are the four-body states that might be attached, five-body states, six-body states that might be attached to these. How does this connect and relate to the uh, nuclear chart, sort of building up nuclei from the deuteron, triton, alpha particle, and so on? Are there similarity? Um, right? There's also saturation in the nuclear sector. And then I think more generally, when I started off by sort of talking about living near unitarity, I think there are a lot of open questions in terms of going to open quantum systems. What, what type of universality do we have there? What happens if we go to other dimensions? What type of universality do we have there? What happens if we go to a lattice system? So it could be QCD, it could be a condensed matter lattice system, it could be photonic, lat photonic lattices. Um, there are a lot of questions there. Um, so really it's an exciting area. Um, there's a lot of exciting work going on that's been demonstrated, shown by the program participants. And so with this, I'd like to thank you. Operator built out of X is R, 
plus something which was DDAS, which is not an operator in the Hilton space yet. We have it. Picture is the computer. So uh, I don't see the analog of the Langville paradigm, but one of its axis and the unitarity of point being a change of phase or a change of uh, phase from symmetry, the onset of symmetry. Yeah, I mean, I, I would argue there's still inspiration coming from that analogy in that we, we have... What is the order for an one over a s? Anyway, the symmetry is not a symmetry. B, C, B, C, a crossover problem. It's, it's a crossover. It's not a phase yeah. uh, transition. So, uh, you do change from a, a, a both condensate on the positive side to a BCS paired uh, fermion on the other side, uh, depending on the sign of 1 over AS. Oh, okay. yeah. So okay. in superconductivity, there is a, is that the analogy for superconductivity? I think uh, Leggett first raised this just in the EEC. Was uh, this a BCS? Yeah, I mean, in that case, it's a continuous, uh, right? it's not a sharp transition. But, I mean, I think in the context of, of this discussion, sort of um, what I was trying to do is sort of draw from a system where, um, right, where some of you might know the, the term sort of uh, universality and sort of at, at least motivate the discussion um, for our topic here. Yeah. And so to, to me, you know, it, it does make sense to sort of think about the correlation lengths going to infinity and then one, you know, the scattering lengths going to infinity. Um, Yeah, I mean, if, if you go to a point where the scattering length, or one over the scattering lengths vanishes, and then you adjust your system to have the, uh, in effect, effective range, you know, only that term, and then you scale that, you can still map one system to the other. Yeah, I mean, you know, this this is to start with at the at the two body level. Yeah. And then in the three body sector you you have to go and look at what you would get. 